But the, the title to this is Indie TV, OTT and streaming, the gateway to the new Hollywood of content to phones, tablets, TVs, and phones, tablets, and TVs, and TVs. <laughs> Basically, what I call this panel is where the hell are we? Where the hell are we going with all this stuff? And how it influences Indie TV, whatever that is, and we'll get to that in a moment. The way I'll do this is I'll introduce the panelists, give a few introductory remarks, let them tell you about themselves. I'm going to only give your, them give you their names and titles because you can look up their bios. They've got fabulous bios, each one of them. Uh, and then we'll start after they each go through who they are, who their company is, and what they think about where we are and where we're going. Then I'm going to do something in reverse. I'm going to see if you guys can think of some questions up front, see what's on your minds. And then I have some questions. If you guys run, hopefully you won't run out. Well, we have usually great audiences who can ask probing questions better than I can. Even though lawyers are supposed to be good at answer, asking <laughs> questions. Um, the little bit about you guys. How many of you consider yourself in indie TV? No one? Good. Then we can talk about everything. <laughs> That's wonderful. How many of you are cord nevers? Oh, older audience. Cord, cord cutters? Oh, wow. About half. That's great. I got to have the courage to do that one day. Ah, our AV guy, too, is a cord cutter. <laughs> mm. So let me introduce the panel. Starting on my left, your right, is Kim Hurwitz, who's the chief content officer of FOTV Media Networks. Mm -mm. Oh, no, that's the old one. <laughs> How'd that happen? I'm sorry. <laughs> K I look, I got to look at my script. I got a newer script. K Coco, KOKO. -K -O. Do you say Coco? It's KOKO. -K KOKO -K -O Sports Magic. It's, you can tell it's a new job, so I keep forgetting she's got a new job. <laughs> And then Chris Wagner, who's executive vice president and co-founder of New Lion. Next to him, Aaliyah Daniels, chief operating office, officer of Reverie TV. Or that's right, just Reverie, right? It's Reverie. I've got TV <laughs> on the brain, don't I? And Frank Giandamo, president and chief creative officer of Fun Little Movies. And last but not least, Michael Downing, who's chief executive officer, president and director of Tout Inc. I'm just co focusing too much on my panelists, aren't I? Not with showing you what's up there. Well, it, it's sort of an interesting issue. I mean, every year things seem to be moving in a direction. And, and when I get to my questions, I will talk about where, or at least ask questions about where we're going and what's different in this whole arena of OTT. But before we do that, I want each of the panelists to tell me, tell you a little bit about what they do and where they think we're going. Kim? Sure. Um, I am. I'm very new to KOKO Sports Management, um, but I'm very excited. Um, CMO there, and um, we're operating in stealth mode. Do people still do that? <laughs> we are. Um, we're developing a very unique sports league, and um, it's international in scope and very exciting. And um, I'm a sports fan from way, way back. And so I'm very excited about that. My past includes working at stints at DirecTV as head of pay-per-view and um, also in cable. Did that pretty much the same thing, advanced most, launched most of the advanced products here in, in this particular market, which is now Spectrum, but it was many, many other cable names in, in the past. I worked for a music company. Um, my last job was with FOTV Media Networks, which um, uh, where I grew the online content to about a thousand channels um, strictly over the top um, so we were device agnostic global we also owned um, cinema now and ov guide and uh, hologram usa and some other entities where are we going, where are we going with this? oh where are we going yeah. <laughs> oh we're going over the top and we're going on mobile because if you look at all the stats um but is it one in four online searches are done even with voice technology. So that's coming out. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess there was a study by Ericsson that came out that said by 2020, half of all uh, TV and video viewing will be on mobile devices. I would argue that we're closer to that n now, uh, even in 2017. And I'm sure Chris can talk more about that. He has direct experience with where people are going. But yeah, I think everything is going um, over the top online, on mobile, and we're going to have a lot of voice activation and facial recognition uh, to customize the experience for us. Chris? Great. Uh, Chris Wagner, but co-founded uh, 
a company called New Lion. We're a OTT platform company. So our customers are people with video rights, content rights, and they hire us to help them launch and run and build their OTT businesses. Uh, some of our customers include Univision as a product that we power for them called Univision Now, which is uh, their two TV linear channels plus a whole big library of on-demand content. Uh, we have World Surf League right down the street if you're a surfer, WSL. Um, we work a, with a lot of sports properties. We did about 63,000 live sports events over the Internet last year. And uh, we're a global company. We have over 500 people uh, based in New York. And uh, to Kim's point, the OTT business for us, uh, with everybody going direct to consumer with some form of content, is um, you know moving at a really fast pace. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, my name is Aaliyah Daniels. I'm the COO and co-founder of Reverie. Reverie is the first LGBTQ global digital streaming platform. We're available in 100 countries. We have over 1,300 hours of content. We actually just launched last year at uh, San Francisco Pride, so we're a little young. Uh, but we are device agnostic as well. We're available on tons of different platforms. We also have a linear channel on Pluto TV. Um, and then as far as our content goes, we're not just strictly movies and television. We're movies, TVs, digital series, podcasts, and music. So we sort of think of ourselves as sort of a one-stop shop for queer-rated entertainment. And as far as where uh, I think we're going, I, I think it's incredibly clear just how quickly and the, the amount of people who are cord-cutting <coughs> that it it's 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 clear that it's going to be OTT and mobile. And in fact, what we are seeing a lot of is that a lot of our users are mostly mobile, not even OTT. So our shorter form content gets a lot of play because people are watching via their mobile devices. Thank you, Frank. I'm Frank Chandamo. I'm actually a professor of web video. I've taught at schools like USC and UCLA. I'm at Chapman University right now. And according to my bio, which is actually true, uh, <laughs> I founded this company called Fun Little Movies. And we were the first ones to do a, a web series way back in the year 2000. We premiered that at uh, Sundance, Sundance's DigiDance Festival. And then we had the first comedy channel on uh, the Sprint telephone network. We were on deck. Uh, back in 2004 and been making video, all comedy videos for companies like Walmart and Petco and Intel and um, also teaching about it at the same time. So I know a lot about and I like to learn a lot about everything that everybody here is talking about and I empower students to do the same and so many of my students have gone on to a lot of success like Freddie Wong uh, was an art, uh, was an experimental video major before he took my class and now he's got billions of hits and two series on uh, on Hulu right now. So that's what I do. Wow. Cool <clears throat> and friendly, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Downing. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of a company called Tout in San Francisco. Tout is a online video network. We basically power all video programming across about 3,700 different websites and provide live and on-demand video programming from broadcast media companies like CNN and Fox and Bloomberg and many others. Um, and we built this network out over the last four years and are now starting to, to take it to OTT as well. And as far as where the space is going, um, I think, you know, a, a um, highly biased perspective on where it's going. My background back in the 90s is I was in the online music space and played a big role in how that industry shifted as consumer behavior started to change very quickly and technology enabled people to do new things. And I see a lot of similarities with what's going on right now with OTT. And if we, if we watched what happened to that industry and ultimately where the consumer ended up, um, I'd say we're at the kind of third to fourth stage of disruption in the implications and the potential of what OTT um, is going to bring, and uh, but there's still lots more excitement yet to happen. So it's um, it's an interesting time. Yeah, that's the Chinese curse. May you live in interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor Chiandamo, I hope you'll call me Professor Berger. I teach copyright at Georgetown Law School, so we have two professors. <laughs> Professor Berger, yes, of course. Now this is this <laughs> experiment. I usually don't do it this way, but Professor Chiandamo suggested it. So you're going to make Frank embarrassed if you don't have any questions. 
to let the audience, for a change, start with initial questions. Qu but questions or topics, topics, topics you want to see covered, yeah. yeah. What you'd like to hear about based on what they've said so far and what's in the program. Yes, in the rear. Yeah, subscription versus ad supported. Yeah. Ad -supported. Mm. Ad -supported. That's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Kim, do you want to lead off? We'll start with you. Well, <coughs> yeah, I think you can see um, the success of subscription based services, I think, are increasing because investors like it because it's money that you can count on and you can plan for and you can work on your retention and your turn rates and so forth. So that's kind of the cable model. And now most of the leading OTT platforms um, like Netflix, like Amazon Prime, like Hulu, they, they, they go with SVOD. Um, I think for big cur bigger companies, that's probably the way to go. It's nice, predictable revenue. For smaller companies, um, it, it may be tougher. It's it's very hard to market, and even though there are a lot of free digital tools out there, um, it's expensive to rise above you know all the noise. There's so many individual little um, subscription pods that are not doing well. Remember CISO, which was backed mm. by a, a major company, folded. They just they couldn't make it happen. And there are a lot of smaller pod channels that are saying, well, it's only going to be $3 a month. It's really hard to get people to part with $3 a month, believe it or not, even though they may spend more on their coffee. Um, there's even the uh, WWE, you know, they were all like a free ad supported and pay-per-view model and they decided to go over the top, but they were a huge brand. It's been around for a long time and a very specific audience. So I think you're going to see a hybrid, <coughs> but I think most of the subscription things that do well will probably be larger companies. L let me tack on because that was one of my questions, so thank you. It was a good question. But Chris, when you're a answering the question, is there a point of the, where the value prop disappears? Because, you know, cable's this bundle. If you start to bundle a lot of subscriptions together to knit your own bundle, it looks like you're paying more than cable, or at least around the same. Yeah, I think when you, when you follow the a la carte and add up all the things you typically like to watch uh, and the cost for those on a monthly basis, you get back pretty quickly to what you're paying for cable. I, d I do think on the subscription side, though, what's interesting about OTT is it allows you to form very niche markets around things you're very passionate about. And even though those markets may not re be that large in terms of size, like Street League. So we work with Street League around live skateboarding. That's a subscription service. Mm. So that audience is probably smaller than a Netflix audience. Mm. But it is a subscription business with very passionate people that do pay ten to fifteen dollars a month to watch live skateboarding events because that's their passion and it's about the clothes the equipment the things you buy the people you hang out with and those type of enthusiast networks do really well we have professional bowling how many bowlers are here it does really well it's one of the, <laughs> no bowlers. Oh, it's no. one of the largest <laughs> recreational sports in the united states it's called extra frame uh, it's about six bucks a month uh, it's direct to consumer. It's bowling. Uh, you have things like um, uh, we just launched with Poker Central Poker, so a hundred live poker events. The other thing that's interesting about subscriptions is it's also global, mm. so you can go very quickly to an audience anywhere in the world using the internet. If you can handle local currencies, take local credit cards, you know you also can build a subscription business very quickly. Yeah. The other side that'd be surfing. That's right here in Santa Monica, World Surf League. That's an advertising-based business. Mm. That's their model right now. It's free. They have great live events. The engagement on their live events is really long. Uh, it's the only place to go if you're a surfing fan. Do you have beach volleyball? We don't have that yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love watching. But that also will go hybrid at some point where you know, I do think there's a combination mm. of uh, content that you put in front of the paywall, you know, and, you, and that's where you drive your advertising. Then you have content typically live that goes behind the paywall because live content tends to attract audiences with longer engagement time so I do think it's a combination mm. of the two Believe but I will tell you that bandwidth is expensive 
So when you go, if you go with an ad model and you have to pay content delivery networks to do streaming and you don't have enough people watching, that gets expensive. If you have a subscription model, you always have somebody paying you for that connection that you have to make from your data center through a CDN to an internet service. And the subscription dollars underwrite that cost. Well, you, your subscription model, right? We're actually a combination of both. Yeah. So uh, we started as an SVOD service. We're still an SVOD service, but we actually just recently introduced um, AVOD in June of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been it's been really interesting. Obviously, um, with SVOD services, your subscribers you have a much longer lifetime value with them. So that's always going to be the plan. But with AVOD, it really allows you to be able to get people within your ecosystem and start to experience your content and really sort of understand a little bit more about your business um, prior to making the leap and, and you know jumping in with a subscription especially because um, our our most of our subscribers and, and our demographic um, it's millennial and gen you know gen the, the newest gen so it's it's, it's <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I think it's Gen Z and so it's you know they're not used to paying honestly right away for for content they have to have an affinity towards your your brand and affinity towards the content you're creating and having a niche is very important which obviously we do but we've noticed that having that avod component really has helped to to sort of usher people within our ecosystem and really sort of understand what we're all about and then want to come on board as a subscriber so for us it definitely is both mm -hmm. frank do you have some thoughts yeah, um, you know, television started as trying to be all things to all people because there were only three networks, right? And that was a su su successful model until, you know, recently. And uh, what, for example, Google says is that 20%, sorry, 90% of all internet traffic is going to be video by the year 2020. So that means that we all want to watch video. And, you know, why read when you can watch video, right? <clears throat> so I say that in jest, please. <laughs> uh, but uh, because we do want to watch video, and our video consumption in an aggregate level is going up for pretty much everyone, right? Because we're now watching TV at the gas station pub. Oh, my God. Right. So if, if that is the case, and, and, and that is the case, then if you want to create a, a specialized network, create one around a passion like skateboarding or like LGBTQ, et cetera, yeah. right? Because people are passionate about those things and will pay to be part of that affinity group. I say it's not just affinity, I say it's passion. And that's the main driver, I think. You know, people liked comedy, like CISO, but I don't know that there were enough people who were so passionate mm -hmm. about it. They might be passionate about, let's say, a Louis C.K., Right, but they wouldn't necessarily be passionate about the overall genre of a mixed bag of different yeah. types of comedy. Yeah. That's right. So That's passion point. is what does it, I think. M Michael, before you answer, I want to <coughs> throw in a little twist. Since you said you were th in the music business in the late '90s, I've got stories. <coughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but. One of the potential problems of subscription, particularly for something that's popular, is that it might very well drive, I hate using the P word, but I've given up on my linguistic battle. Piracy is not a copyright term, but Hollywood has won the semantic battle. Piracy, I mean, CBS yeah. launched this new Star Trek series and put two on for free, and then it's subscription. And even with the free, the CBS exec said, two things happened. One, it drove piracy rates yeah. up tremendously. Even though it was free, the first two, people were just saying, well, that's the way I'm going to get it. Because it's going to be six bucks or to ten bucks, depending on whether you get ads or don't get ads, to, if you just want to watch that and the rest of the CBS material. And they also said they had customer service problems, they had complaints of latency problems and failures. Shocker. And, and yeah, and, and where, where, is, where is the piracy stuff? You know, you, you just put up with whatever it was. Is that a pro going to be a problem with well, a lot I, of Well, I think it is. I mean, we've we've actually learned all these lessons before. Yeah, from like 2000 to 2004 when the music industry went from a 33 billion dollar industry to about a 13 billion dollar industry and part of that lesson was if you make it difficult for me to pay for your content I will likely choose to not pay for it yeah. and I will still get it and I may actually prefer to get it that way so hopefully everybody understands that lesson and the technology is not going to wait around and many technologies can't be sued, shut down, or even tracked down. 
And so, you know, it's kind of an old lesson at this point. It's, it's amazing that, that we even, like, you have kind to of revisit that. that. Yeah. But on the subscription thing, I, I think Chris had a really good point, which is if we look at the market right now, subscription versus ad-based and, and what's happening, there's, there's a lot of different shifts in the market. If we kind of take a step back and look at online video generally in the U.S. right now, Roughly, depending on whose numbers you believe, it's a $30 billion market split pretty evenly between ad-supported and subscription-based. On the subscription-based side, Netflix owns about 85% of that market, right? But the advertising market is a big market. People love free content, even if there's, there's ads around it. So I think Chris's point, which is, in, in our minds, the market is starting to kind of barbell a little bit. On this side, you have HBOs and, you know, incredible, big, high production, expensive, stellar content, which we know people will pay for. And then on the other side, you have, to his point, World Surf League, which I pay for, right? And, and you know, other niche content that maybe not a million people pay for, but if you're really into it and you want to track that, you know, surfing competition that's going on in Nicaragua and you want to actually see it live, you'll pay the $6 a month or, what, or whatever it is. And it seems like the market is, is starting to kind of, you know, right-size itself into those um, two categories. However, on the way to get there, <laughs> as, we're, as we're going there, there's a lot of chaos and fragmentation. And it reminds me, right now what you see in the market reminds me quite a bit of what we saw in March 2000, I may be getting my dates wrong, but roughly March 2002, the month before iTunes came out. There were 85 different yeah. online stores to buy music in. And guess what? They all had different music. You want to get Led Zeppelin? You got to go over here. You want to get the Rolling Stones? Mm -hmm. You got to go over here. You want to get some other band? It was absolute fragmentation, illogical, terrible user experience, way too much DRM technology, to your point. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that got cleaned up pretty quickly. Perhaps not to the benefit of the music industry since they created one one store, one guy who really uh, owned it after that, but perhaps we, we all learned a lesson there um, as well. But I would say we're pretty knee-deep in the fragmentation at this moment. Mm. It, it's, it's interesting because, as I say, what Steve Jobs did was flip the Gillette. Gillette always said, we give away the razors and make our money selling blades. Steve gave away the blades, the music, and sold the razors, the iPods, and made a lot of money off that. Mm. Yeah, I was around for all that. It was in a very interesting yeah. time. And I don't know whether we're learn learning in this space the lessons, but before I start questioning, I, I know this young lady down here had a question. I have a new question. <laughs> <laughs> Based on Mr. Bagley there, how, as a consumer, do we block out something that is so disruptive at filling up your gas tank. I mean, what it seems like it's an infringement it's, on our privacy. This is a it's a good question, which is what the question was, was how do we block out stuff we don't want to see? Like we're filling our car with gas, we want to concentrate on filling the car and cleaning our windows. And you see some of the science fiction films where there's TVs blasting right. this, sort of like 1984. You know, the TV is just blasting stuff at you you're not interested. How do we block that out is the question. You're talking about ads or programming or both? The TV screen that now sits right in front of you when you're putting gas in your car. Oh. Yeah, and imagine, and imagine that's spread. Imagine that's so imagine you have to that's in an electric spreading. car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, there is a way around. But that, but yeah, but then you go to the electric <laughs> charging station, and, and they'll have one there. There's the governor yeah. of Virginia telling what a great job he's doing, giving you free yeah. electricity. No, it's, 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 I think it's that's going to get a lot worse before yeah. it gets better. Yeah. Just see, oh, there's yeah. a lot of new technology coming out there. Are these wafer thin screens that they're putting up inside buildings that sense when you walk by. Mm -hmm. And in the future, they'll be able to recognize your phone and they'll even bring up programming. Yeah. Well, it's like Minority you're... Report, right? Yeah. Right. right. They're walking yeah. by the screen, I mean, they know who you are, yeah. so they throw that kind of ad up there. They're yeah. rolling, yeah. rolling those out in the subways in New York. Right well, now. That'll be our new show. Yeah, I've, I've got, yeah. A, in our building, all the elevators have TVs in it. For, fortunately, it's Bloomberg News, and this is the proud dad. My daughter's a reporter. So I see my daughter in the elevator from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, she's she's in think, New York. I but I, Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, I don't, but I know your point is well taken, and, and it, it, as Michael saying, it's the harbinger potentially of a lot more to come as screens get cheaper, thinner, easier to plastic, more bandwidth. 
But the yeah. ads are getting more relevant. I think they are. To me, anyway. I mean, just look at the cookies you pick up when you go around and what shows up in your Facebook log. Sure, but then, but then you're talking here about a potential, quote, privacy issue that how's the gas pump going to know? Well, it's going to look at your face and say, ah, that's yeah. Chris Wagner. But I tend to be less annoyed about ads that I like. <laughs> yeah, most you know? people are, yeah. Yeah. and that's how this they're going to make that exchange. And you might get better services or discounts if you give them more information. Right. Yeah, there could be that trade-off. <laughs> Again, yes. <laughs> keep, keep asking questions. It Just makes my guy. life easy. Yeah. I've got <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, could you speak to uh, customer acquisition costs? I mean, is that was it going to be any more Let me try and repeat the question because it might not have been heard on the internet transmission if anybody's watching. But we want to know what about the cost of trans trans acquisition. acquisition? I got internet on my mind. <laughs> you know how is how is that? And I want to start down at at Michael's end and work back up this way. Well, I'm probably not the the best person to answer that since oh. I mostly do ad supported um, at this moment. Um, but uh, I, I would bet that. Uh, I mean, in a world where you've got huge social platforms and the ability to target people yeah. in ultra precise ways, that the cost of acquisition for a subscription based service is lower than it's ever been, and the relative efficiency of who you're attacking with that message to try to convert them is more precise than ever. Um, but I imagine Chris could probably speak to that go more directly. Right? Go ahead. Well, I would say, you know, this goes back to the passion question. The more closely you can affiliate yourself with a passion group or a passion project or anything along those lines, the less your marketing is going to be because you're going to be able to line up with existing groups of people, right? Uh, the more generalized you are, the less luck you're going to have and the more it's going to cost, right? So, for example, with Reverie, you know, people want to see your content if they believe in what you're doing. They right. really do, right? Right. Yeah, I, I was I was going to make the exact same point that for us, because we have a specific audience and we know where our audience is, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, social is the best way for us to specifically target our audience. And it really has helped us with our customer acquisition costs because we can hyper target exactly where our audience is. And the thing that's really interesting for us is that, um, our audience isn't exactly just the LGBTQ community. A lot of it is actually also um, heterosexual women who really enjoy the content. And so we can really target you know, women who love RuPaul's Drag Race, which there are a lot of them. So mm. it, it allows for us to really tap into different <clears throat> aspects of our audience that might not have automatically been who we would have gone after, but we know are interested in the content that we're distributing. And did you have a full-time person doing social media or do you all sort of leap in? We're still a startup, so uh, we do have we, we do have someone one, one person in particular who's doing social, but we all kind of you know help out, and we also work with um, uh, Allied Integrative Marketing, who do, who's they're like pros with with social mm -hmm. and and helping us with our customer acquisition costs. So, Chris, I know you have a lot of thoughts about acquisition costs. Well, we spend <laughs> uh, it's all driven by data, and mm -hmm. actually uh, CPAs. We have a number of customers that you know they'll they're called lookalike audiences. So they'll hmm. they'll use the data to really evaluate what people watch in their networks, what devices they prefer, what kind of programming do they prefer, how long do they watch, and they'll create kind of these attributes of their best customers. And then those lookalikes they'll then match up, and they'll go through a social network like Facebook. Hmm. And the math actually is very very good, right? You'll see CPA costs anywhere between ten to twenty dollars. We have customers that have lifetime values of 50 to 60 once they acquire that subscriber. So <clears throat> the money there is really good, uh, and you can be, be very targeted, and you can turn off those ads very quickly. And it's all driven around the data. What people, it's, it's, they're lookalike audiences, and they're actually easier to find yeah. when you're in passion groups about all the different ones we're talking about because yeah. they all have similar characteristics to begin with anyway. And then it's just a matter of... Uh, you know, how you would target people that look like that to get them to convert. Okay. Um, I don't have anything really new to add to those. They're all sound principles. And, and, and when I've worked at 
uh, subscription-based businesses and cable and, and direct TV, the cost, customer acquisition costs were huge because mm -hmm. it involved hardware and everything. It's going to be much less for them for their direct TV now product because it's online. Um, but the one big rule for a subscription business is to maintain your customers and make keep them happy because it's cheaper to maintain a customer than to find a new one. So once you get to a certain base, try not to piss them off. Mm. <laughs> I've got a question on the slide about that later, but I'll wait and see if we have a, at the moment exhausted the audience. Yes, sir. Um, I think I can mention a study by Ericsson that said by 2020, um, the mark for the market size. I wanted to ask about AR and VR, because in that same study it said one out of three is going to be consuming media on on VR, and I think Chris had a, a blog post about a $39 billion market by 2022, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So just wondering how, the, how things are going to change for uh, AR and VR, and what's going to make the difference. Well, for the for the uh, the people that have sporting events, it's a tremendous opportunity because uh, you can create experiences in AR and VR that um, you can deliver either inside the building or outside the building or both. You know, here in LA, you want to sit and see Bomber seat. You know, that's one seat in the building. You may not want to sell it, but if you did it through best seat in the house as a VR implementation outside the building you can get a perspective of L.A. Clippers sitting in Balmer's seat and who's around him. There's Jay-Z and there's popcorn. I mean, the players are running by. So there's a lot of uh, experience-based things you can do in sports, travel, real estate, uh, other things that add value to the core content that I think will be delivered, will be delivered in VR, AR type of uh, the implementations. But Chris, isn't the problem an equipment issue? There's so many different standards. <laughs> Nobody out there. wants to pay for the glasses. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, I don't know. I'm I'm more of a skeptic, having sat through yesterday a couple of VR AR panels. I think yeah. AR is going to happen yeah. more in a stealth mode than we realize. But mm -hmm. there's I, a price I, problem. There's also the power of the of the glasses well, and, themselves, and then they're and they keep changing the OS. well. And then there's video quality because you're going from 4K to 8K, and then they have this whole spatial recognition thing. I mean, at the end of the day, the quality I don't think is there yet, and people still throw up. Yeah. Um, so you have, mm -hmm. you know, all those kind of things <laughs> that are inhibitors <laughs> to it. But I do think I am an advocate of it, and I do think the marketplace is there for it. Does anybody else have thoughts on? Well, you can market uh, television as it won't make you throw up. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the question. Depending on the show, of course. <laughs> uh, any other questions? <laughs> don't be shy. Shy audience. Well, I'm forced to, forced to go to mine. So this this is an interesting chart, straight out of Chung Queen, which is a, a question about video consumption. And China has all of a sudden seen this sort of revolution mm. in online OTT video consumption. There's a 30 year old rapper who is making 75 bucks a month, and he became the biggest hip hop internet star with a series, The Rap of China, 2.7 billion views of 12 episodes, wow. 8 billion on social media platform, Weibo, is that how you say yeah. it? Mm. You know, uh, traditional TV, let's face it, in all markets, including China, still dominates. There's no question about that. But l look at the, the registered cable viewers. You know, TV is sort of stayed stag stagnant, and that's both over the air and, and cable MVPDs, as we call them in Washington. But look at the growth in online video. And so is that a harbinger, this China experience? Uh, the, you know, these people sitting here up on the platform are gonna drive online and other companies like them, they're gonna drive, I'm, I'm really projecting out here <laughs> for all your businesses, is it really gonna drive the demise of, of over the air and cable TV or what is, what's it gonna do to them? Let's just start with Aaliyah. The hot potato to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's hard to say. I think that um, right now there obviously still is value there. I mean, I was literally driving here and talking to my mom on the phone and her, her telling me, oh, I really don't need to keep my cable anymore. But, and she's been, she's been saying this for probably like a year now. Like, I probably could 
you know, cut my cord. I don't really use it that much, but she still has it, right? She yeah. she still likes the the ability to, oh, I want to go watch this right now because it's on and I don't want to wait, you know, wait. Even though I've got a Hulu subscription, I want, I want to, you know, do, I want to watch what I want to watch when I want to. And, and being used to having that broadcast, right? People are used to having what they're having. But I do think that the value of OTT is, is, growing exponentially more and more people are realizing I don't have to do it that way and I think that there's <clears throat> traditional television is going to have to evolve in order to keep up because people especially now they want to watch what they want to watch when they want to watch it they don't want to wait until 8 p.m. on Thursday night to watch their show they want to watch it when they want to and so that type of being able to have that type of accessibility and convenience it's only going to make you know, more and more people want to be able to have subscription-like services where they can just watch what they want to watch when they want to. That convenience is just, it's going to become more and more important. And I think, you know, traditional television is going to have to keep up. And I, and I think cable companies are already doing their skinny bundles and they're, right. they're realizing their business well, the, has to the move. The number I didn't say yeah. was that cable subscribers fell in the first half of this year by 2.5% to mm -hmm. 250 million, whereas online video added 20, I don't know how they get these numbers, but <laughs> added 20 million for a total of 565 million. I, 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 that's amazing numbers. Mm -hmm. go, sorry, go ahead, Kelly. No, no, that's, that, that's fine. I, I, I think that the cable marketers, financiers, they, they're moving in that direction. They see where it's going. Yeah. They realize their business is largely going to be an internet fed business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, device manufacturers like Roku are teaming up with TVs to put the box into the TV. I yeah. mean, there, there's, there's going to be more consolidation, I think. Yeah, that's a whole other issue. You talk about the box. But Michael, did you have Yeah, just, just one note there, which if we, if we look at everything we've talked about so far, it's the structural shift of how people consume content is changing, which is absolutely true, and a big, big structural shift and one that is leaving some of the incumbents and large companies behind quickly. Some of them will catch up, some of them will get ahead of it, some of them will not. But it's important to note that there's another part of this structural shift that you inadvertently mentioned there with the Chinese example, which is it's not just how people are consuming video that's changing, it's what they are consuming. That was another question. Which is changing. So by way of example, my six-year-old and my three-year-old even though we've got Disney Extreme, Disney, the, I think there's like four <laughs> Disney Channel. I mean, I, I would have killed to have all this like kids programming when I was little. They refused to watch any of it. So what do they watch? They pick up their iPads and they watch Ryan's Toy Review, which is the most watched video series in the galaxy <laughs> and with 900 million views a month and a show called Family Fun Pack. Here's what both of these are. Family Fun Pack is a family of five, and the mom carries a camera around and films the kids doing everything, trying on their Halloween costumes, blah, 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 and the kids are enthralled. And by the way, every video they put out, 20 seconds or two minutes or 10 minutes, gets a couple of hundred million views, which is maybe five times more than last night's episode of CSI. So um, I think it's a really important concept that it's not just how people are watching, but it's the content itself. Mm -hmm. So you can throw six billion more into creating the next Game of Thrones. Good luck, you know, lightning in a bottle at <laughs> best. Um, or you can just realize like structurally, people are watching an entirely different kind of content. Now my six-year-old doesn't even watch YouTube anymore. He goes into Roblox, which is a like virtual reality game world where he can go explore buildings and worlds and floors, so it's not even video anymore. So I think um, you know, this is one of the, the key concepts that we have to keep in mind. It's not just the how, it's the what. You went to my follow-up question, which was part of the success of... I teed you up. That's, <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate it. I paid you enough for it, right? But the, the, the Chinese rapper was doing short form. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this wasn't 30 to 60 minute right, traditional right. television. Well, actually, all. in China right now, there are like six apps that are unbelievably popular and by unbelievably popular the numbers are just stratospheric even beyond YouTube and they're all pretty much the same thing where people are videoing themselves in some cases singing songs or singing together lip-syncing songs and I mean it's not you know it's not what you would 
perhaps contemplate as like real programming, and yet it doesn't matter. It's driving, you know, the data doesn't lie. It's driving more consumption, right? Way more than like Shanghai Media, which is one of the biggest uh, TV networks. And so. talking about what you watch, this this chart is showing. A, I'll, I'll get to the questions in a minute. This chart is showing the decline in TV sets in in American households, which I didn't yeah. realize is declining, and also the fact of all these different devices. Are influencing what the content is. I, I'm, I should, I'm saying it. I should ask the panel that. But interesting. I don't know if you followed Katzenbach's um, new venture because they sold SG. S oh yeah, 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 yeah. Katzenberg. Katzenberg. Yeah. Berg. Berg. Wow, yeah. Oh, Wonderco. And <laughs> and he's, he's, his <laughs> new stealth platform is going to be short channels for millennials and Gen Z yeah. that he thinks will decimate the traditional 30 to 60 minutes. He's talking about. The longest form would be 10 minutes, sort of a little novella, then a five minute, I forgot what that's going to be, and then two minute news. Yeah. Do you, what do you guys think about that? Well, that an opinion? We, we deliver 450 million videos started. a month, and yeah. the average length of, of what people watch is uh, two minute and 40 seconds. Wow. That's the average. Two yeah. minute 40 seconds. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I, I would say same. Our, our short form content, again, millennial, Gen Z, mobile users, the short form content is just through the roof. It We have long form con content. We've got our hour length TV shows and full length movies, but our short films, our digital series that are super quick and easy to watch on the subway or wherever mm -hmm. they might be, you know, those things, they just eat it up. It, it It's it's like kind of a no brainer for us at least. Right. Well, I, I can quote. Clips on live. Live goes a lot longer. Yes. Yeah. That's the, yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I can I can quote Chris and Michael here because with YouTube, for example, uh, the best channels are the ones that have a combination of really short things and then really long things. The really long things oftentimes are the live things that you're talking about. But since YouTube rates uh, its payments on watch time now, not the number of hits, but watch time, mm -hmm. right? So you want short things to bring people in the door because as you look at your offerings there, if something's 10 minutes long, you don't know about it, you're not going to watch it as quickly as you would watch something that's two minutes long. That's an easy entry into the channel, and then you watch a few of those. And then if you really like it and you become passionate about it, then you will watch the longer form stuff. So for example, um, Channel Frederator, um, who, <clears throat> you know, they do a lot of, you know, great stuff with animation, right? And they were finding that they could put on short animations and that would bring people in the door, but it was the live or the curated long form shows that were really ticking their numbers up. So to quote Michael, you know, it's, 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 it's barbelled. Yeah, I think there's a mixture of what people watch. And I have another little stat thing that I saw from eMarketer I thought was interesting. And they said that U.S. adults spend 12 hours a day consuming media. And about half is digital, about four hours of TV, and about one and a half of radio. I think they might be putting podcasts or something mm -hmm. in there as well as traditional just listening. Because people are constantly, you see them everywhere you go, yeah. they're, they're multitasking, they're playing some games, they're doing some video, then they'll go home, oh, there's a, I want to see, my daughter wanted to see Riverdale last night, which is a half hour thing, which is unusual for her because usually she's just doing the, the shorter YouTube stuff. So I think people are constantly watching different types of video. So I don't think everything has to be short, short, but there's a lot for of the, action in the, the short, the short. Occasion. Yeah, right. I mean, in, in a different, another example for live, the NBA actually last year changed how they produce live games to fit the mobile viewing that they have. They have a new Mobile One camera that sits right on the court. So if you are a mobile user of a live NBA game, you can actually go in and change it from the broadcast feed to, to a mobile only feed, That's which is now all really tight shots. So you know on your phone, if you're watching a game and they pull way back in the arena, mm -hmm. it just doesn't really look good. So everything now is really tight. Yeah. All the action is tight because you're on a screen this size. It's fascinating. And I like to tell my experience, and I'll get to the questions, which is one of the things I do is lobby on Capitol Hill. So I'm dealing with some very bright, but very, well, I don't know what the right word is, staffers. <laughs> I'll just use that <coughs> on the Hill. And I'm lobbying for a nonprofit that's supporting kids' STEM education. And I've discovered, I've got this great long-form video of about five minutes that really tells the story. I lose them. I lose them after three minutes. 
So I had them edit it down to three minutes, and it keeps their attention, and that's just about all you, uh, all you can deal with. So I, I think it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, I'm glad you brought up the question, Michael. I did have it, but, but that's really good. There's a, a number of questions. This gentleman here first. Yeah, so I have a question on um, revenue models. So there's a, uh, a channel, an all streaming channel called Made to Measure. IMG is behind it, and it's a great platform for all their fashion business, their, you know, their model clients, et cetera. Um, that is a streaming channel that runs on all of these platforms, from Xbox to Apple TV. Um, you look at what's happening on Amazon, where there's a channel called Screenbox that is a channel yeah. that is on Amazon. So I imagine the difference between, say, Made to Measure, a platform that's across all of the OTT, or a channel across all the OTT, versus its exclusive deal, is earning revenue in different ways. Yeah. And I'm wondering what, I'm not sure, it's kind of a big question, <coughs> what are, the advantages to that um, being right. host on a channel, although you have exclusivity, so you're arguably losing the yeah. breadth of exposure that you would that's, get. That's a great question. Because the, the whole economics have changed. It used to, all, it used to always be about distribution. Mm -hmm. So the networks and the, and, and the cable companies drove the exclusivity because distribution, they own distribution. And that's flipped. Now it's all about content. So the leverage is no longer the distributor. The leverage now is the content owner. And the content owner is less and less likely to do exclusives. I mean, the big ones are, especially in sports, because sports rights are you know, over the top. Mm -hmm. But as a content owner, mm -hmm. having a multi-channel distribution play is really the smartest thing you can do. You, you definitely want your own network, because you want the data, and you want to know who they are. And you're going to super serve them better I think that an Amazon or a Facebook or a YouTube could, but you do want those other channels because you're going to find viewers and you're going to be able to, you know, go to the light, Caroline, right? Get them to come in, yeah. right, and become part of the network that that you have. So, because distribution has gotten so cheap and it's global, and it runs on any device, that lever has moved. Now it's all about content and how you engage your audience and so keep your audience. So I strike this deal to have my program run only on ABC. So, in so within the case of Revery, let's say, mm -hmm. when you are, um, you must have like a big ad sales team or you consider it sponsorship. Um, like, because when I look at IMG, they have tons of short form video. I mean, pieces right. that are 90 seconds long. Right. But dozens of them, very snackable, consumable, mm -hmm. you know, content. Um, and there's maybe like a three second pre-roll for Revlon. Mm -hmm. yeah. knows that client watching that mm -hmm. is their customer. Right. So I imagine they're aggregating is the sales process that we're saying, hey, on the average, people watch five of these 90-second videos, which means your pre-roll is really like 20. I mean, right. what's your kind of, how do you sell? Is it advertising, sponsorship? Uh, it's a combination of both. So to go back to the first thing that you said, um, we that is our, our, our plan with Reverie is that we have our native apps, which is, you know, on mobile, so iOS and Android, and then we've got, you know, and like the Fire Stick and uh, Apple TV and Roku and Android TV and like our native apps, but we also, our plan is to be as many places as possible. So your Reverie subscription can be anywhere, you know, possible. So you buy your TV, your TV has, you know, a Roku built in, or you, you know, for instance, you get Sling and you want to get Reverie through Sling, or you want to get Reverie through potentially Amazon in different places. Our our job is to make it as easy as possible for you to get Reverie wherever you, you are, no matter what type of device that you have or a potential service that you have. Like That is our plan to make it as easy as possible. Um, as far as sponsorship versus advertising i mean it's a combination of both it depends on one the content and you know if the advertiser wants to sponsor the content or if they just want to do pre-roll um ad ads for what you have but you know that's not something where we're like oh only advertising or only sponsorship we do a combination of both because it's about one making sure that our creators can get paid and that we're you know building revenue for the service but also you know figuring out ways to get this content out to the audience if it's not behind the paywall as well are you also creating original content? Yes. So are you doing branded content in any way where, you know, it's a show about such and such, but they're always using, or everyone's wearing a Fred Perry or something like that? Right, yeah. Branded content is definitely in the, in the works for us as well. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really good question. I mean, just working with a few companies who are battling with these issues right now, I think what we've seen is that 
you have to achieve scale, so you got to be everywhere, yeah. right? So you put it everywhere. Once you have scale, then this notion of ad sales is a real thing. Until mm -hmm. you get there, it's not a thing. Like, yeah, you can't walk so into true. WPP and say, hey, I'd like a million dollars of advertising. And they, yeah. and they look and they say, well, where's your show? Because right? you get $20 for every thousand views, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, How much runway does a person need? I mean, it gets to your well, money. that's the other problem is ad sales <laughs> is notoriously difficult and hard to scale itself. Yeah. And so it takes about a year to get a team into the field and working. So. This is why you have to lean on those platforms. Right now, Amazon, just using them as an example, Amazon has a lot of ad demand because of who they are. Right. And they're actually committing to ad tech as a much bigger part of their business, as you may have read about in recent uh, weeks or months. And so if you do a deal with Amazon, you could lean on their ad sales team and their demand. It's called uh, Amazon Publisher Services to give you advertising. And they'll keep a percentage, of course. If you do an Android TV, you can lean on AdX for advertising. Um, Roku, you can lean on their network, which is effectively now a sales team, which is selling advertising. But the, the other cases that we've seen that work really well where people are succeeding, like a new channel or a new show or, or new programming, to your point earlier, is early in the process when they're contemplating what the show concept is, they're thinking about branded integrations, meaning going out to Fred Perry and say, hey, we're doing a show about you know a guy who fixes up old motorcycles and why don't we have him wear Fred Perry shoes every time he does it. Those little things can add up to really big dollars. Yeah. And especially the MCNs and other people we know, I mean, that's how they're making a significant yeah. chunk of their revenue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a whole, there's probably still there's a whole team at Apple when I was there who just went around to the studio's product placement. Yeah. Right, right. Frank, you had a thought on this? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, um, uh, an affinity group doesn't necessarily have to be a particular lifestyle. Um, I've started something called LaughMD, where we are delivering comedy content at the moment to healthcare providers uh, on their smartphones, and that's, oh, that's a channel cool. of comedy, right? Because laughter is the best medicine for healthcare providers, too. There was just a story about it yesterday in the Orange County Business Journal about us. And um, you can. Uh, then grow that to patients and then eventually hopefully the general public but there isn't a particular group that you know says you know well I'm the hospital patient group or something like that you know we're all in hospitals at one point or another in our lives right so birth death in between right and so uh, that's a group a that, yeah, exactly. Uh, preferably not today for any of us. Probably not that fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the it's like the ten second news. Half the world is on fire. Half the world is underwater. And Trump just did something to make it worse. There's the news in ten seconds. Uh, but we are, um, you know, we're we're going after that particular group of people at the moment. Yes, sir. That's a big question. I, I, I mean, know. it's 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 a, actually it's been Hollywood driven um, for years, <laughs> and the sports guys are just now starting to adopt DRM. Actually, the first guys to do it in the English Premier League um, has required, um, depending on your browser, one of the three DRM standards to support how you access that live event. But typically, the live stuff has been encrypted, so it's difficult to rip off, but possible. Uh, and the, the sports people haven't really applied the Hollywood DRM, but that's changing pretty quickly. The end users, the consumers can't, you know, it's not always seamless, so it's kind of a pain. Um, it's easier with files and movies than it is with live streams, because you got to rotate these keys, and depending on your browser and device, it gets complicated, but it's it's... It's, it's happening fast because of the cost of content and the expense of piracy. Yeah, but if it's really popular, people will find a way. Yeah. Look yeah. at the recent Conor McGregor Mayweather fight and just a tremendous amount of buys, but tremendous amount of piracy too. And if you've got, you know, FaceTime and Periscope and all sorts of, you know, someone will buy a legitimate buy, but then other people can just. That was not a DRM event. That was all encrypted. Well, Chris, yeah. You, you mentioned something. But I mean, you go around it that way. As a follow up to this, I, I've sort of stumbled in back in the 
late 80s into DRM and content protection and have somehow made a career out of it, so I can't complain about it. But my, my question is the unknown answer is, what is really the economic effect of piracy? And I, again, I hate that word, but I'll use it because everyone understands it. The, 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 the point I want to make about this is, is that there is no empirical studies. Our gut tells us it's got to cost something. But I've never been able to see, I've got lots of studies that are surveys, which are not very useful as yeah. far as I'm concerned, because they come, tell me how you want it to come out, I'll find a survey <coughs> for you that comes out that way. It's just sort of, there's never been a real, that I am aware of, real proof of what's the economic return of DRM, because all DRMs will be broken. There's no question about that. I think just it's an, an important topic, but intellectually, in a way, it's, it's, it's the wrong thing you know, to be thinking about, and, and I'll explain that. You know, back in the 90s, there were 60 companies working on DRM technology in Silicon Valley. You know how many are working on DRM technology in Silicon Valley today? Three. Three. Zero. Well, Intel still I mean, works on it. Intel, you know, that's like Ma Bell. I mean, you know, that, that place, you know, there's also still working on telex machines. In there. So. I'm just saying there's well, a reason why that me. is. Intellectually, the best way to, to deter piracy, if you really think that's negatively affecting your business, which I agree with Jim, you should quantify, mm -hmm. is make it easier to buy, pay for, or watch a sponsored version of that mm -hmm. content than it is to steal. Yeah, right? that, that was and it really has to do with the first part of that. Yeah. If you're making it hard, elusive, challenging, technically cumbersome at all for me to consume your content, I can absolutely figure out a way to get it anyways. Mm -hmm. So, you, you, you know, you, you, I think the intellectual ex exercise here is you got to think about the mega trend of what's happening right now is right. there's more content being developed than ever. There is no scarcity of content. Regardless of what many people from different companies in Los Angeles would like to think, there is no scarcity of content. There's more good content being produced every minute of every day than ever. And so, you know, to be thinking about how do I lock mine up or, you know, put it in a really tight box that's hard to get into, I think intellectually is kind of the wrong, the wrong way to be thinking about it. It's the way we, the, I, when I say we, I represent the IT industry, so I come from the IT bias, Ma Bell Intel, I know. But it, when we went through the DVD exercise, and I don't have time to talk about it, we convince the studios they ought to put DRM on it and license it out. But we said, look, this is not going to guarantee anything other than somebody who's honest will have a stumbling block to cross. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you, we can't talk about price, that's an antitrust issue, but hopefully you will put a compelling marketing plan together which appeals to people. It did. They made tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars off DVDs, even though it was broken in two years by a 15-year-old Norwegian kid. Yeah. But I think if you have inconvenience built yeah. into your business model as a way to build margin, you will get <laughs> piracy. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. true. Inconvenience, let me use another word, windowing, oh. uh, yeah. packaging. Um, Geo-blocking. You can, you can, yeah, you can that's expect, true. but because it's stupid. It, like, makes no, it, no one cares if it works for your business model. The consumer you know, is the one who, you know, if you make it easy for them to get your content, you're in business. If you make it hard, you know, it's, it's kind of all that's Yeah, This is something that we recently dealt with at Reverie. So one of our originals, um, it was based on, I was called Before I Got Famous, and it was a Chinese uh, actor who comes from China over to Hollywood and sort of like the adventures that, that he has. And we got a lot of press in China before it was released. So it was definitely being talked about over there. China's our number three market. And we mm -hmm. knew that it was going to get pirated. Yeah. Like we, we knew because, because of the press that it was getting, we knew that it was going to get pirated. And so we had a convers yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. But we, we had a, a, a conversation internally to say, okay, how do we deal with this? Do we like, we know this is going to happen. And we just decided, you know what, this is an opportunity for us to get more people within our exactly. ecosystem. Right. We gave it away for free in China in China alone. Mm -hmm. And we were able, we got so many downloads in China for people to come over to watch it. And then we already had other, you know, queer Chinese content on our platform. We have over 50 hours of queer Chinese content on our platform already. So mm -hmm. this was an opportunity for us to get people within our ecosystem to take that press. And instead of just waiting for it to go up on Billy Billy for us to actually just say, Hey, no, just watch on Reverie. We're giving it away for free. You don't have to, you know, <laughs> making it easier for the consumer to get your content, and it ended up working out for us. That's, that's that is a good market. Mm -hmm. Young lady in the back. I have a question that deals with content and talent. Um, you mentioned the, the comedy medical thing that you were working on. Um, actually, the work with national talent, but I do have comics who are doctors and things of that nature. So that kind of got me excited. 
athletes and like don't Dor and Boston America's got talent and then thirty million people know what Long Snap Road really is. Um, so it's interesting when I look at shows like AGT, for example, that can take unknown people, many of those shows in America, I will make them national from a digital perspective. But I guess my question is, as you talk about these different ideas like your shows, um, your your show, your medical show, how do you agents like myself find out about the needs that you might have, whether it's a professional athlete, a stand-up comic, or an expert? Could be, yeah. <laughs> Do you all get the question? <laughs> Is there an answer? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I, you know, the yeah. trade magazine that I read is Tube Filter. That's my number one. It's a good one. Yeah. And uh, I've, uh, Tube, Tube Filter. filter. And they also sponsor the Streamy Awards as well. So they're really kind of the who's who and what's what of uh, web video. And when I do do something, it's often, you know, that's where we'll announce it. And I've written for them, you know, a fair bit as well. So that's my hot tip for the day. <laughs> yeah. Two video, everybody. <coughs> how many, I'm curious, how many of you have ever heard of Ultraviolet? Do you know it's dead? <laughs> the, the studios, all the majors, you know, Disney didn't join, they started Key Chest, and all the studios that were in Ultraviolet announced their the big ones are pulling out and going with Disney and Disney's platform. Yeah. But it leads me to the question, those of you who don't know what Ultraviolet is, it's a, it's a purchase. You buy a key and your video is in a locker in the sky, which you can watch from any compatible device, which is most devices. My question is, is there really, is it anything more than a, it used to be we bought lots of, I mean, I've got, I've got a shelf of 120 DVDs, and every time I go look at it, there's nothing I want to play. <laughs> Seriously. So is, is, is there a, 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 and while Blu-ray is doing okay, it's not doing as well as DVD did, and we'll see about ultraviolet. Is, is owning a piece of media something that's going to be more a niche market in the brave new world OTT? I mean, Disney had an announcement this week about download to own. Yeah, that's this. <clears throat> so I don't think you own anything physically other than a file, but you can download it and watch it offline. Right. So to watch it offline, you have to manage the rights, copyright, protect it. Right. Put it in a locker. You have to have a compatible device that has right. the right DRM in it. So I think in that particular instance, you don't have anything physically. Right. But you are able to watch it unconnected. But Yeah, but it's not a stream. You, quote, own the content well people want to own content is my question yeah well you're going to download and you're going to have a file on your machine right but do the, so. is that going to be i don't think so i don't think yeah. so i don't think so <laughs> not <laughs> even not even for music I was you know? hard. Yeah. you've got spotify I mean, yeah. there's many uh, is, pull yeah. up anything I, mean, it's like, I, it's, I want it's very yeah. different from the nostalgic novelty that people get from buying vinyl records mm -hmm. which if you probably know vinyl is selling more now than it right. has like since 1979 hmm. Um, but it's, it's for a different reason. People like the warm sound of vinyl and it's cool and the DJ culture and all that kind of cool stuff. There's no real analog in film. It's not like, oh man, I've got this old VHS. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not the same unless I watch it on that VHS, yeah. right? Got John Wayne. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's different. But there's, there's one other interesting point about what you were talking about with the ultraviolet thing. And, and not to draw too many comparisons to the challenges that the music industry went to. But, uh, you know, we, we documented these kind of steps that the industry went through when they were faced with dramatic change in the online music. And the first response to fundamental change in consumer behavior was to try to sue it out of existence. Yeah. Yeah. Abster. The second was to try to convince people that artists would no longer create content for this medium if this continued. The third was poorly misguided internal inside the fence development efforts to create their own version of whatever the movement is, ultraviolet. And then the final step was capitulation where they said, okay, this is happening, there's no way we can fight it. My earnings reports every quarter are getting more and more painful. Uh, therefore, we have to bless somebody and actually play ball. Which yeah, part, part pretty, of their lawsuit close. too was trying to make technology illegal. Yeah. That didn't work out. No, the, the <laughs> Rockster case didn't co quite come out the way that they tried to make it come out. Yeah, but also, I mean, you know, just from a data perspective, <coughs> look at the market cap of Apple versus yeah. the market cap of CBS. 
but look at the market cap of Google versus the market cap of NBC Universal. And I'm not saying this as a criticism. Maybe anyway, this is representative of what's happening in the market, right? Yeah. Where technology is driving the consumer experience, and and you know, the roles of these companies are changing. That's cool. Uh, it's a book I recommend by. It's an old book, but I think it's still relevant by Andy Grove, called "Only the Paranoid Survive." And basically, he said, when your business has never been better, when you've never made more money, it's time to figure out how to destroy it. Because if you don't, someone else will. Yeah. And that was the music industry. I, th I thought it was less than 33 mi billion, but they, w they were a large business. There's a group but inside of Google whose job is to think up ways to destroy right. Google. Yeah, seriously. Mm. No, it, seriously, that, because that's, that's your, gonna be your next challenge. Not, not the marketing challenge you have today, which is a block and tackling challenge. It's the fact that out of left field, some competitor is going to come and blow your business out. In the case of Intel, it was the DRAM business. The Japanese came in. I mean, Intel was coining money in the 70s on DRAM. And actually, Andy Grove said, I almost destroyed the company because I ordered my chief executives. If you're not working on making DRAM better, faster, cheaper, you're out of here. And then the Japanese came in, and he held an exec meeting, tearing his hair out. He said, what am I going to do? And this group from Hill, Hillsboro up in Oregon said, well, we disobeyed you, Mr. Grove. We have this little 8086 processor you might be interested in. And because they figured we got to destroy this business and do a new one, they saved the company. And that was the, the music industry. Yeah, definitely. Yes? Speaking, excuse me. Speaking about uh, ads, we have a nonprofit that Google gives us X amount of free ads every month. And it, it's, it's for our website, basically. We can never get enough clicks to spend the money. So we're a smaller <laughs> girl. And no matter what, and I'm pretty good at writing copy. We have other people. We write the things, okay, you scored. You did great this month. And I look, we, hard, we couldn't spend the money. But they claim we're in this percentage, which is very good. And it's 2 or 3 percent of click-throughs or something, I don't know. But when, when you're a smaller group and you're trying to not compete with you guys, I don't even, you know, we're, we're looking at it, but we're going, we're being sponsored by major people and they try to train us. But what is your question? The question is, how do you stay above the, you know, we're in the middle of something, how do you even stay when you have the ability to do something and you aren't hitting the mark. And that could be true in all your businesses, you know. Like how do you stay up with the changing right, technology and so on? Because we're getting, we're getting tremendous sponsorship. Yeah. Well, but you're, you're not locating the passionate core that we've been talking yeah. about that will <coughs> lift your, your click rate at least through. They think we're getting a great click rate, but I don't know. Yeah. You know? Well, I think to, to I think the point Jim made earlier, which is, um, it's really hard to be a media company and try to appeal to a, just a big, wide open blend of people. I mean, we've seen this happen in the web world, where all these general news sites tried to put up paywalls, and what happened? Nobody paid, mm. and so the entire payroll, ex you know, experiment was a, was just a, a, a colossal failure. And basically, what that was saying is. Look, it's not specific enough, direct enough. People do pay for The Economist. People do pay for the WSJ and for FT and, and other publications. But if you're just like, you know, the the local paper or whatever, you know, it's, a, it's a tough one for people to think through. So I think there's, there's a lot of validity in trying to think about who is that core of the audience who's so passionate, so into it. It might be a small fire, but it's a really intense fire of passionate people who love whatever this media is, and just do nothing but serve them. You and know, don't try to go after everybody else. On that note, maybe there, there's things you can do to reach that passionate consumer in a different way. So maybe yep. not just with a website, but a few more little stats here that I found that were interesting. Speaking of FT Financial Times, they doubled in the last year their likes um, on Instagram because they started doing video. So even though they're a news company, they said, look, maybe we need a bigger presence um, on an Instagram rather than just on the World Wide Web. And then also the LA Times, if you're from this area, they started off with a podcast that they're doing, this Dirty John, saying that maybe that's, so they're going to print the podcast in the paper 
or you can get the podcast for free. So, and it's investigative journalism, and it's something that, you know, the newspaper world does well. But they're trying to do something beyond just a, a printed newspaper or a website. So the the lesson is No, so that was really, maybe that's one way of expanding your brand, of, of reaching out to find that passionate consumer. They may not be someone who just goes to a website. Well, yeah. that's the one thing. We do have 400 videos that are on YouTube, but that's a whole other thing. But are you on Snapchat? Are you on Twitter? Are you on... There's it's other things. Really I mean, Twitter's really looking for video. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think the lesson is try every way possible right. to find that passionate group. I think there was... You had a question, sir? No, I was going to mention about, you know, news outlets try to monetize yeah. their content. And a really good and bad example is the LA Times, where even if you had a paid subscription, in order to read that, you have to go through advertising and videos and pop-ups and, and it was impossible. I mean, even though you were a paying customer, they were throwing so many stuff at you that, yeah. that yeah. people, yeah. I mean, at least, you know, I cancel, I, I know it didn't work, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. At least we aren't trying the European experiment, which was a great success in Spain. They decided that, that they passed a law saying that Google would have to pay for just the search results. So Google said, fine, we're turning off all the Spanish news media. And the click rate on the Spanish media went into the basement. Wow. And, and yeah. they were begging the government, please turn this around. But in the European <laughs> draft directive, the Estonian president has put that in, that yeah. Google and others will have to pay when they give you a search result with just a snippet. They call it the snippet tax. A snippet. Yeah. I just don't see that working. But I think the Europeans think if we do it all in a, as a block, Google will have to cave. But I don't, you know, my guess is Google won't. But th that the point, though, is that there's a lot of ways to reach audiences. I know I do work for a nonprofit, and they use every possible social media that they could think of to get out there and find that passionate group. Yes? Can I ask, is there a least common denominator when it comes to content type, or rather, do you not want the least common denominator that works across all of these platforms that you see on the screen? For example, just as we developed, um, you know, responsive websites that are going to appear different on mobile, differently mm -hmm. on mobile, is there, has it ever been contemplated to have content that's slightly different in form <coughs> that is what you automatically get if you're going on, uh, you know, if you're accessing it from mm. an iPhone versus um, Roku? Yeah. Just curious if there's anything that would, if there's any sort of data you've gotten that shows uh, a certain type of concept content is more frequently consumed on one <clears throat> platform versus another. I mean, you have the the whole discussion about uh, browsers and apps, mm -hmm. where apps take advantage of the capabilities of the device. Mm -hmm. Swipe mm -hmm. versus HTML5 looks the same. So there's cost advantages and there's disadvantages. Long form video, the data basically shows that you need to be an app instead of a browser. But long form video performs better on app. People watch it longer in an app experience than they do in a browser experience. But I guess Definitely. The, the, the lowest common denominator is really <coughs> the short form content we talked about earlier, which seems to be consumable whether I'm on Apple TV or I'm on my iPad. I, yeah, I, I think that's accurate. There's yeah. two data points that we have that's not exactly what you were asking, but what we have seen is there's certain verticals, you know, like certain sports verticals and certain, that that audience <laughs> seems to have certain device characteristics, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, one vertical like eSports, which is a vertical we deal in, I mean, it's, as you probably imagine, highly you know, mobile, like it's almost all device. Like there's no desktop. Um, there's actually very little, you know, like OTT going on. It's it's more, it's more like on people's phones and on people's um, iPads. Now the other thing that we've got, which is not exactly the same data, is we actually see that there's different device patterns at different times of the day. And so there's a big bell curve in the middle of the day, which we call the lunch viewing hour, which is generally highly desktop oriented. Um, because people are sitting at their computer, presumably at work or at home, um, you know, watching something. And then in the morning and at the end of the day, we see a higher mobile um, concentration, which is just kind of interesting. It doesn't really pertain to the content itself, but it's just different patterns of how people uh, are consuming. 
Any other thoughts on that? Last thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would just sort of reiterating what I said before, for us at least, we're seeing short form on mobile mm -hmm. and then our longer form content on OTT. So on our Roku's and Apple TV's and, you know, Chromecast, things of that nature, we're seeing more of that, more of the long form on those types of devices. Well, this hour, hour and 15 minutes flew by for me. <laughs> and Professor Chindamo, you were right. We changed, it, <laughs> changed the, the approach a little bit, and I think it worked. I want to thank the audience for yeah. great questions and thank a really good yes, panel. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Good luck with your network.